Hey, this is Joel Duff. Welcome back to my channel. And today we're answering college student questions about evolutionary biology. These are real questions from real students. I know that because they're students taking my evolutionary biology, uh, my online evolutionary biology class this summer. And to create some opportunity for engagement in the class, both between students and with myself, uh, they are engaging in a couple different discussion forums. And one of those discussion forums allows students to ask, simply ask questions of things they've always wondered about evolutionary biology or a challenging question about evolutionary biology to other students to see what kind of answers they can, uh, they can get, including from me. Uh, this gives students a chance to ask something maybe that they feel like I am not talking about in my lectures or not having them look at or feel like I'm skipping over. I do this as a regular practice in a couple of my classes. Um, where I have what I call Q&A days or stump the professor days. Um, they're typically anonymous question days where students bring in a, an index card or a page that has a, a question they've always wanted to ask and have answered and it's anonymous. And then I have a student just read those questions to me in class, collect them, read them to me in class, and then I have to stand up in front of the class and provide my best possible answer. I wanna give students a chance to ask something maybe they're always curious about. And I tell them they can ask it like, here's something I heard or here's something I saw on Facebook or on social media about evolutionary biology. And I've always wondered like how to answer that question. Or I've always found this particular issue challenging. How might an evolutionary biologist answer that question? Uh, or they might be very much opposed to evolutionary biology because of their background and they may want to challenge me on some, you know, present some kind of information and see how I respond to it. And I always say that my responses are going to be partially, like, potentially very personal responses, like here's how I individually or personally would respond to that, or here's how I think uh, the evolutionary community, here's what the evolutionary consensus is, or the scientific consensus on that particular topic. Or in some cases, it's like, I really don't know what the consensus here is, but I am challenged to come up with a hypothesis or a potentially, uh, uh, a potentially reasonable explanation uh, for their for their for their question, um, in this case, in the in the summer, I don't have an opportunity to do the anonymous Q and A thing. So we just have this discussion forum, and in which everybody has to post some kind of question uh, in order to create some kind of engagement and discussion uh, in the class. And this was a pretty this was a really good set of questions. And I found myself uh, when writing answers and in, in being involved in the discussion forum really feeling like I had so much more to say or so many more things I wanted to say that I, that I had time to write out. And so I told the class that I would make a video for them in which I went over all of their questions and I'm going to hit, I think, every single one of the questions from the class. So as I was preparing to make my video in response to them, I thought that maybe I should just, uh, I, I should record my answers in such a way that I could share it uh, more publicly. And so I asked the class if it would be okay to share their questions, uh, de-identified, of course, uh, and so forth. And so these questions are all ones that are actual questions that students asked, and this is going to be my attempt to answer them. Now, the, the caveat here is you have to understand that what I'm going to do now is you're going to see my recording for them. And so, as I said before, my responses are going to be, here's my best attempt to understand what I think the core part of your question is, like what are the fundamental assumptions of your question, uh, and then address that question both in the individual aspects of it, but also try to give a larger perspective of like what this issue is about, because um, this is a teaching opportunity uh, for the students. And I may or may not throw in some personal responses depending on how personal the questions are to me. I mean, that's one of the advantages of doing this discussion forum or having anonymous Q&A uh, things in class is that uh, I don't, you know, students can ask uh, basically anything they want uh, about this topic and I will, I will attempt to provide some kind of response to it. All right, so uh, here we go. This is uh, answering students' questions, and as you can see, I've done, this is just a brief snapshot to the side here of topics addressed. And so I, I had the feeling I might have to chop this into two parts, so I may not get to all of these in this first video, 
but eventually I should cover all those topics and several more. Actually, several of those topics listed there, there were multiple questions about. And I'll show you each of those questions and I have somewhat different answers uh, for each of them. Lastly, I was gonna mention that most of this is just me answering off the top of my head, all right? Almost as if like I'm in class and this question was asked of me, how might I respond to that? And so that's the other fun part of the anonymous Q&A day that's live, right? The students get to ask whatever they want and I'm on the spot and I just have to provide an answer with whatever's in my head. Uh, and that can be really nerve wracking, um, but it can be kind of fun. And usually the students really, I would say most of the students really enjoy that day a lot. Uh, they end up asking a lot more questions after that, which is another reason why I do this type of thing is because it's a great icebreaker. Um, students typically not wanting to ask questions, being nervous about what they can ask the professor um, and how they might be responded to by other students in the class. And so I'm trying to set a tone of a conversational tone of being able to ask really difficult questions and maybe to admit what we don't know or, or what we what we find challenging or what we what we think we don't believe and trying to hear each other out. I guess we it's time, we gotta get to these questions. So coming up next, answering student questions about evolutionary biology. Okay, I changed my shirt, so hey, it's time to get going. Let's start with that first question. And um, I, I titled this question, Most Evolved Species. So down in the left-hand corner for each of the questions, I've kind of like given a really brief summary of what the question is. Uh, and this is a good place to start. This is a good place for us to start with our questions. In your opinion, is it a fair question to ask which species is the most evolved? Why or why not? And if it's a fair question, which species do you think is the most evolved? I asked the question because it's a question I received in my animal physiology class and I had a difficult time attempting to answer this question as it is complex. Uh, so it, this is a good place to start. It really isn't a fair question within the context of evolutionary biology or with the context of what we're going to learn in this class, right? Um, each species has its own unique history. Each species is adapted to a specific environment and has its own set of characteristics that make it best suited for that particular environment, right? For survival in its own particular ecological niche. So you'd have to be asking yourself, what makes something the best species, right? If I were to say, what's the most evolved species? Well, then you're really asking what species is the best fit for its, its particular environment. Or if you only had one environment, which is the species that's best fit for it? Thing is, if you only had one environment, one niche, one set of environmental parameters, there probably would only be one species that best adapts to that particular environment to the exclusion of all other species. And so I guess you could say in that situation, you had the most evolved species, but you'd only be saying you had the most evolved, most adapted set of organisms or individuals of a species for that particular environmental condition under those particular specific environmental traits uh, or conditions. As soon as you move to another set of environmental conditions, that same organism that was very well adapted, or you could say evolved for that particular environment, is no longer the best for another environment. There's going to be another organism that is best fit for that other environment. So you might be thinking, many people are thinking evolution is sort of this uh, ladder-like thing where organisms are progressively climbing to somehow higher states all the time. And so the idea of the most evolved actually goes back to an idea that we talked about. So remember in class, when we we're talking about sort of the, the, the evolution of thought, the history of thought, and we talked about the great chain of being. And we talked about sort of that being different, uh, different higher states of being. And that's then co-opted in some early ideas of, uh, well, early but not modern evolutionary biology ideas of that somehow organisms are progressing to different stages, right? And that they're on this, they're stepping up constantly. They're constantly seeking to become better in that way, right? As though there's some sort of linear change of progressive climbing to some sort of higher states. See, evolution, which is just an ongoing process driven by genetic variation, 
natural selection, and the other mechanisms that we talked about in class. It's not striving, right, to an end point. It's not striving to some predetermined goal. And the whole idea of this question is, what is the most evolved? Almost does kind of smack of the sense of there is a sense in which organisms are trying to become the best, all right? They have this predetermined, they have this goal, they have this thing out in front of them. And whoever gets to that point is the most evolved. So rather than talk about most evolved, it'd be more accurate, all right, more scientifically sound to describe species in terms of their unique adaptions and evolutionary histories, rather than to try to sort of rank them on a scale of being more or less evolved. Each species has its own set of characteristics, as I just said, and that's going to allow them to survive in particular niches. Hey, I can think of an organism that is really well evolved for living in water, right? It has a lot of specialized traits for being able to uh, capture oxygen, right, from uh, the water. But you take that organism out of the water and place it on land, and it's very poorly evolved for that particular state, that particular place. And human beings have uh, amazing features for survival in this world, but there are many places that you and I can go for which there are other organisms that are better adapted than we are. Are we going to say, should we say that they're more evolved than we are? I guess in a relative sense, they're better adapted for that particular location than we are for that particular environmental condition. So every organism, I, I can think of it as every organism that's alive on the earth today, all right, is really well adapted to some specific set of environmental conditions. And they are the most evolved, all right? The, the most, the best adapted organism for that particular environment at this point in time. Otherwise, there'd be a different organism there at, that, at this particular uh, moment in time. All right, so I think that's enough for that one. Okay, uh, okay, that was kind of rambly. Let's hope that I warm up a little bit as we move along. So another classic question. Of all the questions I get over many, many years when I ask for student questions and I have the Q&A days, um, I would say anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of those questions will be about uh, human beings and are humans changing? Are they adapting? Is natural selection still happening to human beings? Are we affecting uh, natural selection in some way? Uh, some, kind of, some kind of aspect about how evolutionary biology affects us. And so here we go. Here's our first question involving that from this class. I think an interesting topic to discuss is how evolutionary theory still applies to the human species. We may be advanced, but we are still a species of organism. That being said, do you think that evolution theory still applies to modern day humans? Do concepts like natural selection still take place in today's society, even on a minor scale? Or are we at a point where we're able to compensate for any needed evolutions with our own advancements, such so much so that we're no longer evolving? All right, so the question is, are humans evolving? Are humans evolving? Okay, I can answer this one very simply. The answer is yes, of course, because all populations are evolving. Think back to what we talked about with uh, the Hardy-Weinberg theorem, all right? And Hardy-Weinberg is kind of, you can think of it as like a null hypothesis uh, for evolution. What would it take to stop evolution from happening? And here, of course, I'm using the, the, the very basic definition of evolution being change over time. In this case, and for biological organisms, it would be changes in allele frequencies over time or change in the genetic the frequencies of different genes and populations. Right? And what would it take to stop changes in gene frequencies over time? Right? You couldn't have genetic drift. You can't have any natural selection. Right? You can't have any mutations. I mean, all those change populations over time. And if populations are changing, well, then the population is evolving. Now, I recognize that many people, when they hear that word evolving, they're thinking of something somehow much larger and grander, you know, molecules to man, or how man or some other organism is going to change into a whole different kind of organism. Well, that could be the cumulative effect of lots of changes over time and changing environmental conditions, forcing organisms to adapt and change their features to better fit that particular environment over many, many, many generations. But technically, each population, if it changes from one generation to another, is changing, it is evolving, right? Nothing's gonna, nothing can really stop that from happening. So human populations, humans are evolving. 
in that sense. So that being said, go back to the question. Do you think that evolutionary theory still applies to modern day humans? Well, evolutionary theory, as you've seen, evolutionary theory is all about um, talking about mechanisms that affect this type of change. And what are those mechanisms? Natural selection, genetic drift, mutations that are occurring, uh, gene flow uh, among individuals and populations and between populations, right? All those things are happening in every natural population or really every population of organisms that I can think of, including human beings. There is a form of natural selection going on. There is genetic drift. All these factors are at play and continue to be at play in the human population. What is different is, here we go, are what, it, the, what factors or what things, or I guess you could say how much the strength of natural selection on some features have changed over time, such that some characteristics that were under the influence of natural selection in the past in human populations may no longer be under those particular uh, pressures today. So because of our technology, right, an individual that might have a particular combination of gen genes, a particular combination of alleles that in the past might have not been fit in that particular environment. Maybe they didn't, wouldn't have survived till they're, to the point where they could reproduce. Well, that is a form of negative selection, right? Those individuals wouldn't necessarily have offsprings. They wouldn't pass their genes down to the next generation. And therefore, those particular alleles wouldn't be represented in the next population. But today with technology, some of those characteristics now no longer are lethal or make a person unfit. They can live a normal lifespan. And because of that, they can have offspring and therefore they can pass those alleles to the next generation. That means those particular alleles aren't under aren't experiencing the same kind of natural selection they were in the past. So it is true, our technology has changed the different evolutionary pressures. The mechanisms are all the same, but the strength of the mechanisms on different features have changed over time. But this is true for, this can happen to all populations. Not that all the populations generate technology, but all populations experience environmental changes, right? They experience changes to their environmental conditions. And therefore, that changes whether they're undergoing more genetic drift, natural selection is being affected in different ways on different genes. And so every population is going to experience over many, many generations changes in how they are evolving, right? The pace of evolution for different characteristics and so forth. So it wouldn't be correct to say that we're no longer evolving. Every single, every single allele in the human population is experiencing some kind of change from one, from one generation to the next. Um, all right, now, I, there's so much more that could be said here, but there's several other questions that are related to this one, so I'm gonna use those questions to sort of uh, go a little bit further with these. Mm, okay, next question. Has human evolution stalled out? It's kind of the same idea as the previous question. Let me read this one. As a result of natural selection, whales evolved over a long period of time to adapt to life underwater. Viruses, however, are locked in an evolutionary arms race against improved immune systems and medicine. I'm not sure what the however means because I don't know how that's a contrast with whales, uh, but this creates a constant state of evolution for viruses. Um, now, the suggestion here is that because viruses, because viruses invade and inhabit other cells of other organisms those organisms don't really like to have viruses in them right and so therefore those organisms are uh, having mutations which then are selected for that help it avoid viruses right fight off viruses and since they're fighting off the viruses the viruses have to also experience change because that's an that's their environment right their environment is the cell they're inhabiting and invading and if that environment changes they either have to change or they will go extinct. And so they experience mutations. Some of those mutations allow them to overcome the boundaries, the challenge that those cells are placing on them. And as they overcome them, they become better at invading those cells. Of course, those cells and those individuals that have those cells, right, also are having mutations that are being selected for in order to help them overcome that viral evolution too, right? So that's the idea of this evolutionary arms race. Uh, and so 
this person in their question is saying, well, this creates a constant state of evolution for viruses. Viruses are constantly having to evolve. Hmm, interesting here, because that's actually, uh, uh, that's over, hmm, how should I say this? That's sort of saying that, oh, only when uh, organisms are seriously challenged by their environment are they evolving. But I just said in the previous, uh, I just said in the previous question, everything is always evolving. <laughs> Sometimes it might not be very apparent because maybe an organism lives in a very constant environment. And as they live in a constant environment, they don't need to make a lot of obvious changes because they're already fit for that particular environment. And then it was they're undergoing what's called stabilizing selection. They are being selected to not change in any particular direction, but to stay the way they are because they're fit for that particular environment. Um, but even that is um, evolution still happening there. There's still mutations. There's still natural selection. There's still genetic drift. All the mechanisms are still at play, but they're all kind of canceling each other out uh, in their interactions. And they're producing uh, an effect of the organism not actually showing um, dramatic changes over time. Now, whales evolved over a long period of time and they, you know, they adapted to life underwater. It doesn't mean that now that they're in underwater, they're not evolving anymore. Right. They're not experiencing the types of changes they were before because now they're fairly well adapted to living in the water. But they're certainly adapting to new challenges in the water uh, and becoming better at whatever they're doing. So, you know, like their prey, <laughs> if their prey goes extinct, uh, they have to switch to another form of prey, in which case they're not going to be exceptionally well adapted to eating that particular prey and they're going to have to experience some change in order to become better adapted once again to eat that particular prey all right i didn't i haven't even gotten through the question yet um humans on the other hand with the help of technology and societal norms have developed techniques that circumvent these factors for example improvements in the medical industry help humans fight disease instead of forcing humans to create their own immunity to this disease with an increase in the number of factors that act against natural selection, are humans still capable of evolution? And if so, what extent? Right. Same answer as before. Yes, <laughs> humans are still evolving. Humans still experience all those mechanisms of evolution that all organisms on the face of the earth uh, um, face. Um, that The fact that we have circumvented, or how shall we put it, we've created a new environment, right? That new environment is forms of technology that allow, they're like extensions of us, right? Instead of, sure, I'm not changing the way my fingers look, but because I can hold an, uh, a tool, I can do something which allows me to do things, uh, which overcome some other, you know, instead of having to change myself, I'm using the tools to, to uh, progressively become more fit to my environment. And so does that mean I'm no longer evolving. I just said that inappropriately. I just said that I'm no longer evolving. But of course, I emphasize all the time it's individuals don't evolve, right? Populations evolve. Does that mean the populations aren't changing? Well, okay, it means they don't, they're not changing that particular trait. That particular characteristic may not be under selection to adapt to the environment because the characteristics you have are perfectly fit because of the technology extension of us. But are we changing? I'll go back to my example of middle digit hair, right? The, the, the hairs you may or may not have. And um, that's an example of genetic drift. There's no natural selection on that uh, that we know of. And the next generation of human beings, some of us are going to have middle hair and some won't. It won't be exactly the same percentage of the next generation as is today. And so therefore, that's going to be a change of that trait over time. And there's actually hundreds of traits that we have that uh, kind of doesn't matter what technology is, we're passing them the next generation and sometimes more of that characteristic gets passed the next generation and sometimes um, less of the other contrasting character gets passed to the next generation. And therefore the next generation is gonna look different, right? So the population is going to change. And of course there's still natural selection happening, right? We can't possibly circumvent all the hundreds of uh, hundreds of things and hundreds of characteristics in our body that are being selected for for our overall survival and so natural selection is happening we just tend to think of really big dramatic examples of where we're circumventing a natural selection at times <laughs>
So has human evo evolution stalled out? Another perspective on that might be to say that um, uh, as you've learned about what things affect populations and the how quickly populations can change under different conditions, the human population is absolutely huge. And so even with technology, even with strong selection on particular characteristics, um, in the sense that most people are thinking of this question, like evolving, like are humans going to change into something else that looks very different than us? Would we become a different species? Uh, we're such a large population with so much integration of our genes. In other words, gene flow is very high across the entire population uh, across the world. Um, and that is always mixing the gene pool. And so it's very difficult for any particular traits in any particular individuals uh, to come to to um, eventually dominate the entire population. Ah, uh, there's so much more. Um, there's so many different places I could go with this question still, but I have to contain my answers to, you know, five minutes max. Otherwise, uh, this uh, talk's going to get way too long. So that's my excuse for moving on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this one, besides, the next question is very similar. So, can humans cause evolution? Now, that's it. That's um, it's a little different than the previous question. The previous question is whether human evolution or human change has stalled out and are humans no longer changing. This is more, can humans affect the world around us and cause changes in other organisms? The simple answer is yes. And I, I'm going to say it's simple because at its, at its root level, every organism is affecting other organisms because every organism is a part of the environment of other organisms. Yeah, obviously, organisms live very close together and compete for the same resources are going to have a much greater effect on those organisms than, say, an organism living here versus another species living in Australia has very little effect on each other. I don't say no effect because they're breathing oxygen and they're potentially changing the atmosphere and that's going to affect the other organism eventually over time, but it's going to be a very, very tiny effect. Right? <laughs> it's like, um, so, but the point is, every single organism... All right, living in the same environment or similar environment is affecting the organisms around them. So therefore they're part of their environment. So anything that organism does is going to affect the changes that occur in that other population, right? It's going to affect what alleles in that population make that particular species or those particular individuals in that population more fit for that environment. You take one species out of a particular ecology, right? Uh, a, a, biological ecology, like the organisms in that particular environment, you take it out. Well, that's going to shift all of the different forces, all right, that are there. It's shifting the balance of, of resources among those individuals. And so the competition among those individuals for the resources is going to change competition for the space um, and yeah, innumerable factors, right, are going to be affected by the removal of a species. And therefore, the evolution of all those different organisms is going to be affected. So coming back to human beings, we could say the simple answer is that, yes, human beings have an effect on other organisms. Right? We affect other organisms in the way that we uh, deal with them. They have to adapt to us while we're doing things to them. Um, all right, so let me read the question. A section of the book on whales tells us that whales evolved over time based on their need to adapt to the environment around them. A prominent example is they used to be animals that walked on land but now live in the sea. Um, I, I might tweak that a little bit and say that they're based on their um, opportunity to adapt to the environment around them. You know, land animals or animals that are um, semi-aquatic, right? You can think of today like otters or something like that. Right. They take advantages of resources that are in the water, but they also live on land and participate in some parts of their life cycle on land. Right. So if you have an animal that lives in the water and they can see that there's a, there's a lot of resource in that water in terms of like food in that water, then one way to take advantage of that would be to any changes they experience in that population that allows individuals to better procure those resources in the water is going to be an advantage allowing them to potentially have more offspring, which means they pass down those differences in them that gave them the ability to procure more resources in the water. 
And so if that means a somewhat more streamlined body, if that means like having a certain amount of blubber that allows them to float and swim in different ways or makes their nose shift slightly uh, farther back so it makes it a little easier for them to get air when they come up, right? There's hundreds of different things that could happen that could give individuals slightly better opportunities for procuring resources in the water. And so as those happen, they are adapting to that particular environment. All right, sorry, long tangent there. Um, there are multiple examples of other animals that have evolved and changed over long periods of time. Yes, that is proposed. Evolution biologists believe that that transition from land to sea, you know, is is over like a 10 million year period. Uh, so that that's a lot of generations, right? If you were any one moment in time during that, you would simply see a species that is adapted fairly well to whatever it's doing. Um, and you wouldn't think of it as like a transition between one or the other. You'd just think of it of like, hey, otters, you know, they're, they're really good in the water and they're good on land as well. However, there are examples that took place many, many years ago. You know, these things are things that happened millions of years ago before humans were around. Can we as humans influence the evolution of animals and of ourselves? Well, I already said, absolutely. <laughs> we, and we have... Um, as we as we proceed through this class, we're going to see many examples of how human selection of organisms has dramatically changed uh, the organ the, the the life around us. So, for uh, just a real quick example uh, from the book, like bighorn sheep, right? Because hunters, you know, prefer to uh, the largest horns, right? That has taken those out of the population. So those bighorn sheep, especially the males that have the largest horns, have less of an opportunity to reproduce. And presumably they had larger horns because they had genes, slightly different versions of genes that allowed them to grow those larger horns, right? It could be a whole suite of different genes that, that enabled them to do that. Uh, and that's a heritable characteristic. And so if it's heritable and they were killed before they were able to reproduce, they're not able to pass those large horn genes, right, down to the next generation. And so what's happened is, is, in, is the observation, we have the evidence, right, after, after tracking uh, bighorn sheep out west over uh, the last hundred years, is the horns have progressively gotten smaller, right? There are hundreds of examples of this, of how we have changed the shape and characteristics and even behavior of uh, wild animals in our environment because of our behavior, you know, what we're doing terms of hunting, trapping, um, you know, our cities, uh, interactions with sound, um, all the different things that we do have a variety of different effects on organisms around us. Uh, and they are adapting to this environment where we are very much uh, a large force, right? We're, we're a large component of the environment. And so all, virtually all animals have to do something to survive in that particular environment. They're experiencing the natural selection, which is we're the, we're the, we're the selective event. Um, right now, this, uh, this question suggests uh, two things. Uh, I can think of two, two examples, I think, of instantly. We're breeding animals for certain desirable traits, like dog breeding. So I gave you examples from we're actually affecting uh, organisms indirectly in the sense that I am not um, artificially selecting. I'm not like, I want this particular trait and therefore I'm going to use my knowledge of natural selection because we use, you know, we understand natural selection. <laughs> You're learning about natural selection in this class as a biological process. And as a result of that, you can say like, I can use this process to manipulate organisms. I can choose traits that I want and have them be the survivors and have them reproduce and have the next generation have more of those traits. You're simply accelerating the pace of change, right? You're accelerating the pace of evolution by doing that. Well, evolution for those characters anyway. Evolution really should be thought of as like the whole organism, the fitness of the whole organism. But you can, you can accelerate the rate of change for particular characteristics dramatically through the knowledge of the process and specific, attempted, uh, specific attempts to manipulate that process. Now, humans have make lots of changes to wild organisms or uh, we're not where we're not specifically artificially selecting them 
like my hunting example. Yes, we are selecting them, but no one's out there thinking, I want to make bighorn sheep have smaller horns. And therefore, I'm going to do this in order to make this happen. It just happened because it happened naturally. You know, our natural inclination in hunting in the types of things that we want for trophies results in natural selective processes which cause the reduction in size of horns. Um, dog breeding, though, is like, hey, I want spots, right? I'm going to select the, the puppies that have the spots, and I'm only going to allow them to reproduce with other puppies that have spots, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this over and over and over again until I have the exact genetics I want. Yes, absolutely, we are manipulating the environment. We are dramatically changing organisms and their genetics that way. Um, and we're bringing over invasive species. Yes, that's another way that we are dramatically changing the world around us. Prior to human beings traveling to Hawaii or traveling from one continent to another. I mean, how were animals going to get from Europe to North America? So the animals are here in North America have been experiencing an environment in which they've been interacting with the same organisms for long periods of time, right? So they're adapting to each other, right? They're all adapting through these processes of natural selection, genetic drift, gene flow, and so forth. And all those processes have sculpted each one of those species into the environmental, uh, into the relationships they have with other organisms in their environment. And then what happens is you bring in a new organism to that particular environment. And it's usually fairly disruptive because they're gonna eat some resource, right? They're gonna procure some resource that might be just physical space is a resource. Um, and as a result, every, every other organism has to sort of shift, right? It's gonna affect every organism in a different way. And human beings have been especially good at being disruptors, you know, in the environment that way because we bring stuff from one part of the world to another and introduce species and types of organisms that have really never encountered each other before or if they've encountered each other it's been millions of years ago right so when they encounter each other for the first time in a long time um, there is sort of a shakeout period there uh, that's going to require probably some fairly quick adaptation of both organisms and many times some organisms can't adapt very quickly there's a limit to how fast you can adapt so you either adapt or you die. Well, in this case, you go extinct, right? And so a large portion of the extinction that happens today is because of the mixing of organisms around the earth. And most of that can be blamed on human beings. I hate to use the word blame, but I mean, it's just, it's hard to deny that uh, we are the major contributor to the movement of organisms uh, from one place to another. You know, the stuff that we brought to Hawaii has dramatically changed the landscape of Hawaii, right? We, we've altered... Uh, so many different organisms on Hawaii, the natural vegetation of Hawaii, and made a lot of it go extinct because of the organisms we've brought there. Um, so in that way, again, we're not um, doing artificial selection. It's kind of natural because it's just like what we're doing as a species is just what we're doing as a species. But the effects of what we're doing as a species have large ramifications on other organisms. Um, so uh, this question goes on to say, these are small scale examples, though. Nothing close to the evolution timeline of a whale. Well, yes, right? There's not been millions of years. Uh, what's impressive or depressive, I guess, in, in some ways, what's impressive is, is that the amount of change that has happened, you know, on this earth just in the last, you know, couple thousand years, um, most of it due to human interaction. And as like I said, moving stuff around has caused large um, upheaval uh, among species and organisms. And so we can see a, a tremendous amount of change in organisms um, and, and actual real morphological shape, color differences in organisms that have had to very quickly adapt uh, to, to their new situations. Um, but still, nothing like 10 million years uh, of stuff. So, I mean, I guess you could anticipate that because of the way the world has been mixed up in the last couple thousand years, uh, that's going to play out over thousands of more years into real differences um, that, that we will see. As time passes and technology understanding of evolution gets better, can we cause large-scale evolution? Well, cause, uh, there's two words, two means of cause here. Cause could be direct cause, like 
I want that organism to evolve in a certain way. We do do that, right? Right. We've taken a wild bovines and we have selected for them making enormous amounts of milk and we have changed their morphology tremendously uh, as a result. Uh, and we have taken many different organisms and drastically changed them. I think of, uh, of cabbage and cauliflower and broccoli and all those different things. That's just one small wild um, plant that we have manipulated, right? into overexpressing different characteristics of leaves or or stems or shoots or flowers uh, and radically change their appearance uh, over a fairly short period of time so and that way we do cause well again the words have uh it, we could spend hours defining terms but large-scale evolution um I don't consider that large scale evolution, but many people might look at that and say like, well, that's obvious differences between those organisms. Kind of like a big difference between a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. Is that large scale evolution? It, it's not really, it's actually uh, changing just a few alleles, but very dramatically. But all the rest of the organism is pretty much the same. That's, that's the thing with artificial selection. You have to understand artificial selection creates uh, monsters in this world. It really does. It produces organisms that the nature wouldn't make, um, that only we would make by via intention, right? Because we're only looking at certain characteristics. I want that characteristic, so therefore I'm going to do everything I can to get that character. Um, but you're not actually changing most of the other characters of the organism at the same time. And so you can dramatically change one characteristic, making an organism look really different, but genetically they're still quite similar to each other, right? Still compatible with each other. So that's not what I think most people are thinking of when they think of large scale evolution. They're thinking of, um, they're thinking of a, a, a primitive carnivore becoming a bear and another primitive carnivore from the same population over time becoming cats and other ones becoming dogs, right? And having fairly unique characteristics that we can tell apart. Uh, from the two. That's that's more large scale grand mm. evolution, which is just a lot of individual steps of the same thing that is happening around us in the world all around us right now all the time. That's just an accumulation of that change in different habitats. Um, our artificial selection, what will it do? It's hard to imagine it making organisms that will dramatically change too much because when we really home in and select organisms. We usually make organisms that are depopulative genetic variation, which makes them very susceptible to being unable to evolve anymore. Going back to the original, the first question, or the question before, you know, is human evolution stalled out? And I said, no, there's tons of variation, tons of variation in humans, and there's billions of human beings, which means there's a, an enormous genetic gene pool. So there is lots of potential for organisms, for human beings to adapt. Um, but in organisms that are uh, selected for, right, artificially selected for, um, they tend to lose all their variation. And after they've lost all their variation, now that's where you're getting to a point where an organism can't evolve. Because if you're a clone, right, once you become almost all the same, like my old English sheepdog, um, there's other old English sheepdogs, and they're all very closely related to one another. There's not much difference between them, which is why when we bought our old English sheepdog, it has all the characteristics that we expected to get, right? Down to the behaviors, right? It's just, it's just like, this is incredible. This is exactly as advertised. And that's because there's barely any genetic variation there. And so as long as old English sheepdogs are bred with all other old English sheepdogs, there's, there's not a lot of opportunities for them to change very much, right? They changed a lot to get to the point where they are, but now they're kind of stuck. And there are some natural species that are that way too. They've run out of variation or they've been, well, you've learned they've been bottlenecked. And so they don't have much variation and they are very limited in how much they can change. I don't want to say evolution has stopped because as long as there's any differences between them and the differences um, are passed to the next generation, they're heritable, there's going to be changes over time, right? The population is not going to stay identical over time, 100% identical. And therefore, it will evolve. It'll just evolve extremely slowly. And it won't be able to adapt very well to its environment. So it's, 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 um, it's very much in danger of going extinct.
as a result. Oh, okay. So should we do that? You know, can we cause large scale evolution? Um, all right, and all everything I've just said, uh, I, I gave you a lot of different perspectives. So now we have to kind of break that down into sometimes we're not intentionally doing something, um, but once you realize how natural selection works and you realize the effect that human beings can have on other organisms, it does make you then ask the question, okay, I am aware of the things that we can and how we can change organisms. Should I want to change those organisms? Or is there is there a way in which I should say I should uh, I should pull back and say we shouldn't be affecting organisms in this way, we should allow them to evolve without our influence? That's really tricky. It's impossible to completely pull back because we are part of the environment. As long as we're part of the environment, we are going to affect the evolution of other organisms. But as I've been saying, we have an extremely, a very profound and strong effect on some organisms. And the question I think really comes down to um, if our profound effect is such that we wipe out a lot of organisms, that will have an effect on us in the future. And, and since we can think about the future, whereas other organisms really can't think about what their future is and plan for it, since we can think about what our future is for our kids, we can think about how we might want to mitigate some of the, the most drastic changes we're making to the current environment in order to protect some kind of level of diversity in the future, um, because that's probably a healthier environment than simply having all cultivated organisms that are incapable of, of change. <laughs> well, okay, I just opened up a giant can of worms. Um, Let's move on because there's some similar questions and I'll probably be able to uh, delve into that a little bit further. And I spent way too much time on that question. Um, Re-evolution of species or parallel evolution? Um, Darwin's theory of evolution had an explanation for new species or the origin of new species, how new species are formed. He theorized that new species emerge from natural selection, I would say via natural selection, via the process of natural selection, which tied into his idea of descent with modification, where organisms descend from ancestors with some sort of change. Right, organisms experience mutations or have variations, and some individuals survive and pass those variations to the next generation. Other individuals may not survive and therefore don't pass their particular variations to the next generation, and therefore the next generation is modified, right? They're descending from one generation to another with modifications, especially when you add in the idea of mutations, which is, which is not really a large portion of what uh, uh, Darwin could really talk about because um, he didn't know the actual source of variation. But modifying organism, he could certainly see in like dogs, right? I see a new, what looks like a new variation, something I don't see in wolves. And uh, I pick it out, and now I'm going to pass it to the next generation. Well, that's descent with modification. That's a new modification. Like a, and he didn't know there's a new mutation, floppy ears, right? Um, and that that that's a particular mutation, and uh, that's new to to domesticated dogs. And so individuals are like, oh, I like that characteristic, right? So I select that characteristic, pass the next generation, and voila, we got dogs with floppy ears. Like both of my dogs have floppy ears, you know, and we like them. And so we're the selector. Right? So we're selecting that particular feature, and um, that's descent with modification. Environmental factors determine if change is beneficial and will continue to be passed on, or if it, the change ends with that individual. <laughs> hey, what about my dog example? The environment is um, us, really, mostly us. Uh, floppy ears aren't really terribly useful in the wild. You know, so if a wolf had that mutation, they had a floppy ear, they're more prone to getting infections. Uh, they probably don't hear quite as well. Gonna get some ticks under there. I mean, there's there's a bunch of problems potentially with floppy ears and people who have floppy ear dogs know that there's more problems with the ears than those that don't. Um, so in the wild, natural selection is like bad idea, right? That individual may not survive quite as well as its kin, which didn't have that mutation. And therefore that mutation will be lost, right? That's the same idea, it's, it's not beneficial. And therefore, it's not going to get passed on. 
But floppy ears happen to a domesticated dog, and we look at it and we go like, oh, that's so cute. And we intentionally select for it. And what do we do? Oh, you had an ear infection. Well, I'll take care of that for you. We are the environment. And in that case, the environment says that characteristic is beneficial because that dog got better treatment. Oh, I've got two puppies. One has floppy ears and one doesn't. Oh, isn't that floppy eared one so cute? Right? So if the floppy eared one is preferred, that's saying that that characteristic is has an advantage in that environment. So that's a beneficial change. The beneficial change then gets propagated into more and more and more dogs. And now there's tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dogs, right, that have floppy ears. Because we are the environment that maintains and selects for that particular beneficial characteristic. With new species coming into existence in this way, would previously extinct species be able to, after a long period of time, be reintroduced in the same way, assuming environmental favorability for those adaptions? I'm not exactly sure what this question is getting after. Um, when it says previously extinct species be able to, well, if they're extinct, they're not going to be really, we're not going to be able to put re, be reintroduce them into the same environment. But this student might have heard about something called de extinction. Um, de extinction is uh, the idea of bringing back organisms from extinction. And that would have been an unheard of thought in the past, but now that we can do genomics and we can extract DNA from ancient organisms that have gone recently extinct, not like dinosaurs, but uh, woolly mammoths. Um, if you were to take that DNA, we might potentially be able to someday, and I think technologically probably will be possible at some point, never say never anymore because DNA technology is incredible. Um, take that DNA and then basically turn an elephant into a mammoth by changing out all the genes in, a, in an elephant and replacing with mammoth genes, right? That might be one way of doing it. And then you're going to produce a mammoth. All right, then you can introduce the mammoth into the same environment. Um, but you know what? The exact environment that mammoths lived in in the past isn't necessarily present today because for hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years, uh, the species that they did live with in the past have been adapting and changing. And so therefore, the environment is not going to be exactly the same. I'm not saying they couldn't survive. They can still eat grass and, and, and do various things. But the climate is different and so forth. And there's other animals that have uh, adapted to maybe the, the fact that they're missing in that particular environment today. So really, organisms brought back from the past into the present are not likely to be exceptionally well adapted to the present environment. That goes back to the very first question. What is the most adapted? What's the most evolved species? Well, mammoths were um, very well evolved for their particular environment at, that, at a particular time. Unfortunately, the environment also changed and they did not adapt fast enough to be able to change and continue to evolve and maintain their their ability to survive in that new environment, right? Whether that's the environment is humans killing them, which is possible why some of the, uh, some of the elephants uh, went extinct, um, or it's just other factors, right? Either way, um, at one time, they, when they were alive, they were well adapted to uh, that particular environment. Um, but those environments are always shifting and changing. And so all organisms, there is no organism that can go like, hey, that's it. I don't need to change anymore. I'll just stay exactly the same. Um, that's not a recipe for success, right? All organisms are always changing. Some don't change very much, but they're always changing. Um, so I'm not sure what else to say about this question. Environmental factors determine which changes it would. With new species coming into existence in this way, right, there are new species forming all the time. Um, would previously extinct species be able to, after a long period of time, be reintroduced in the same way, assuming environmental favorability for the adaptions? I don't know if I remember saying if you took an, an extinct organism and you brought it back to life, and then you would it be able to adapt to new in, the new environment? Um, yeah, it should be able to have some adaption. Here's the problem with de-extinction. Okay. Sorry, a lot of tangents here, but this, these types of questions bring up lots of interesting uh, basic biological principles in evolutionary biology.
So, or population genetics, which is really what evolutionary biology is, population genetics. Um, De-extinction, let's say you brought back the mammoth by simply replacing all the genes in, a, in an elephant. And so then that elephant then gives, gives birth to an organism that is basically a woolly mammoth because it now has all the genetics of a woolly mammoth. But that's the only woolly mammoth that is in existence. I mean, you could do it again then and make a, make a female, right? You could, get, you could change the genes, make a female, and you have a male. Then you could have them reproduce. The thing is, there's no genetic variation there. Right? It's going to be all the same genes, and they're going to be homozygous. They're all going to have the same exact copies of their alleles. Whereas in a natural population of most any species on Earth, there's dozens, if not hundreds, of versions of every gene in the population. Which, which allows for lots of variation in the offspring. The offspring have all kinds of slightly different characteristics. In this case, they're basically clones of each other. Now, eventually they won't be clones because it is impossible to copy your genome without making mistakes, right? We talked about mutations. And so when they copy their genome and make mistakes, they're adding new genetic variation. But most of that variation is gonna be useless, right? The vast majority of mutations aren't gonna happen in genes. They're not gonna happen in exactly the right spot to make a type of variant that's actually gonna be useful to that population. So it's gonna take a long time, thousands of generations potentially, before you build up a certain amount of variation, you start seeing variation in that species, which would then allow it to adapt to the slightly different conditions that it's now living in compared to when it was alive in the past. So this is an enormously long process in order to get a well-adapted organism that's been extinct to live in the current environment. Um, moving on, a previous class that I took raised the question of what exactly a species was. Humans are prone to organizing uh, things and, being, and beings into lists and groups. It's more important to become the, is it more important to become the most evolved species or individual? Okay, there's that question again, right? It just came back again in, in another student's question. The most evolved, all right? As I said, there's not really anything such thing as most evolved. It's all relative to that particular environment. I guess you could, like I said before, you could say, I've got a specific environment, different, this temperature, you know, this much sunlight, you know, this much of this research, this much phosphorus, and everybody has that exact same stuff. And you put like five species in there. One of them probably is, one of them will probably be the most adapted for that particular environment and survive the best. And if you continue to allow them to all grow and, and reproduce, one of them might eventually be the winner and kick out all the rest. The other ones might all go extinct. At which point, I, I think it might be appropriate to say that that is the best evolved species for that particular environment. But it's all relative to that environment. Because you take that species out, move it to another environment, and the organisms that are living in that environment are, are clearly going to be better for that environment. And because that other one's adapted to a different environment, it's not the best evolved. Right? It's not the best species for that other environment. No species is the best for every environment on Earth. So it's really hard to talk about most evolved species unless you're talking about it within a specific context. Okay, sorry, got off track there. At what point, if any, does the organization of species become arbitrary? Furthermore, how, does, how, how do we determine whether we are completely correct in our organization and does it matter? Well, how do we determine if we're completely correct? Uh, since uh, classification is a human endeavor to to just um, organize the world around us. It's not necessarily going to be like the right answer. It's simply if everybody agrees that this is the best system, then that is what it's going to look like, and that and that might matter because it's very helpful to have a similar system, so that we can agree on a common language. So that when I say something about like what the Taraxacum efficient alley. Uh, dandelion and somebody else in a different part of the world be like I know just what you're talking about because we've agreed on a system of identification and I understand the limits of what that thing is because we have a definition of like what constitutes the boundaries of that thing and that could be the boundaries of a species the boundaries of a genus the boundaries of a family um, some ideas that contribute to this question involve looking back on the evolutionary record if two species evolved in parallel from different ancestors, but their outcome is the same, would they be considered the same species or not? 
at one point do we decide that a species has evolved differently enough to become considered to have diverged into two? Hmm. Okay, now this question is being asked uh, before uh, we've gotten to the point in class where we talk about speciation and we talk about what is a species and you're going to be experiencing a very abbreviated discussion of what a species is and by abbreviated I mean I'm probably going to spend like a half hour on it. Uh, I've, ta I've taught another class, um, Principles of Systematics, and in that class I spent a full like four weeks discussing species, right? Like we talk about species definitions and all the different ways that people have tried to define what a species is. And we ask whether, we ask the big question, are species real things, real entities, or are they simply human constructs? Like our way of organizing and imposing, um, uh, let's say structure to this world for our own benefit, but not that it really exists. All right, so let me back up, go back to the beginning of the question. So this concept of species, it is really central to identifying what we call biodiversity and how we talk about how organisms have changed over time. Um, but it's really challenging to define exactly what a species is. And I'll say that that's part of a continuing ongoing scientific debate that I don't anticipate will end anytime soon. Uh, and this is because species definitions, if I want to define a species, um, depending on what field you're in, what type of organism you're looking at, you may be inclined to want to use a particular definition that just doesn't work well for other organisms. And so the question has become, is there a universal species definition? Is a species a thing that is the same type of thing across all different types of organisms? I would say the consensus today is that, it, that there isn't such a thing as a, the same definition for all different species. It's easy for me to say that because there, there's no agreed upon definition of species. And you might be saying to yourself, okay, but what about this uh, biological species concept that we all had to learn at some point that if uh, that species are groups of individuals that have similar characteristics and are able to interbreed with other such individuals, right? And have, and have offspring, right? They're, they're reproductively able to um, integrate with one another if I could put it in a more population genetic way. Um, bacteria, uh, they don't have, they don't reproduce with one another. There's lots of asexual organisms. Are there species of asexual organisms? And if your definition includes reproduction, how then do you apply that to a non-reproductive organism? Now, I mean, they reproduce in the sense that they divide, right? They do like binary division and they make more copies of themselves asexual organisms do, but because they never interact with one another in, in the sense of sharing genetic information, yes, I know bacteria can share information, but not at the same in the same way at all that animals do. Um, the definition itself doesn't really work very well, and that's why there's different definitions for species in bacteria. You know, when we categorize and organize species, these really are kind of human constructs. We're aiming to understand the classification and diversity of life because we want to be able to uh, count like the number of things that are out there and we'll be able to like say there's this much diversity in this particular environment what does that mean well i have to have some kind of concept of what diversity is and it usually is going to be predicated on the number of different types of species there that are in that particular location and sometimes then we talk about genera and families and those are clearly not real entities there's no such thing as a genera a genera is just a, a certain amount of difference all right and that's just something where scientists get together and by studying and working with one another and writing papers and disagreeing with one another, eventually we kind of come to a consensus like, yeah, you know what? Canis is a genus that includes like, you know, wolves and coyotes, right? And, and a couple other things. And we call that Canis, the genus, because all those species are very similar to one another. They're, they're different species but they're similar enough and they're similar enough that we're going to put them in the same group called a genus. But then there's also foxes, the lupus, no, vulpes, sorry. And uh, they're similar to canis. And if we put those together, we'll put them in a family. We'll call that a family. But there's no, like, if humans weren't around, you know, that wouldn't be like, oh, like all those organisms get together and go like, hey, we're one big family. We should hang out together. <laughs> no, they're all individual species that communicate within species, like right? they're willing to 
integrate genetically within the species, but outside the species, it's like, pff, I don't really know you, right? I don't really have much communication with you. That it's going to get complex because, of course, some species can hybridize with other species, but they don't do it very much. So that has to come into the definition, too. Right. This is a question we could go on and on and on and on about. Um, at what point, if any, does organization of species become arbitrary? Uh, in bacteria, it's kind of arbitrary. In bacteria, we've we've kind of gotten to the point where we uh, we just uh, sequence a bunch of sequence, sequence a bunch of sequence, sequence a bunch of DNA. Uh, we, we capture a whole bunch of their code and then we ask how similar is the code of this individual to another individual. And if it's 98, 99.7% uh, or 99.5% or 90, 98.5% similar, then we say that's the same species. They effectively have enough similarity in their genes. They have slight difference in alleles, just like you and I have differences because you and I are not exactly the same. We're some percentage difference. We're 99.7% the same. That means we have millions of differences between us out of our 3 billion base pair genome. Um, but you and I are the same species, right? It would be possible. We, we, we have similar enough genetics. Um, and we can use a reproductive uh, definition for human beings. But in bacteria, we just like, eh, there's the percentage. And then we say like, you know what? You're just a little more different. And there's others like you that are similar. Like this is 97% similar to this other bacteria. This bacteria is 99% similar to these other ones. So we'll call those the species. And these ones are 99% similar to these other individuals. And as a group, they're 97% 97 similar, different species. And then they're 92% similar. We'll, we'll put them in different genera. And, and sometimes we correlate that with physical characteristics, right? Uh, staining capacity or shape of the cells or their ability to interact with certain kinds of chemicals. Those are morphological characteristics that we might use to then like say okay dna great but i want some characteristic i can point to and say that that represents that species uh, but honestly most bacteria haven't been characterized right they're just known by their dna and so we we end up with groups of things and we kind of give them classify we classify them based on their genetic similarity um so the more succinct answer is that we don't, there are different definitions of species for different groups, and it's a practical thing. Practically, it's simpler to use a genetic similarity a matrix for bacteria, but in animals, especially uh, land vertebrates, um, we can look at their reproductive um, capacity. And because we can actually do the hybridization, and we can see if they're compatible, and we can look at their genetics and see if they're actually sharing genomes over time in a population over many generations. And that's what we can use to say like, yeah, these are functioning as a species over time. But the last part of that question is, how do we decide when a species has evolved differently enough to be considered to have diverged into two? And that's what we're going to talk a lot about later in the class is that um, at any one point in time, as you look at different species in the world, some of them are on their way to becoming different species, like foxes, right? There's red foxes in California in the West, and there's also red foxes in Russia. And we consider them part of the same species, we call them subspecies because they're isolated from one another. And they've been reproducing with each other and they've experienced mutations and they've experienced different natural selection because they live in different environments and they look different. They have like slightly different uh, tails and they have different coloration patterns and they eat slightly different foods. And so their mouths are a little bit different because their teeth are slightly different. And yet if you bring the foxes from Russia to California, they probably could make a fertile offspring. And so it's, ah, they're still the same species, but I can see differences. So they're a subspecies. Just fast forward, uh, 50,000 generations from now, right? 50,000, 100,000 years from now. They might, if they still stay separate, they might accumulate more changes and at some point they're no longer really compatible with each other. They'd be new species. But what day that happens? There's not gonna be one day where it happens. It's a, it's a gradual process. So it's like, a, it's like a population, I don't see any differences. And then there's some differences and then there's more differences and then there's a lot more differences and somewhere in there, they've kind of morphed into two different species. Um, so we'll deal with that quite a bit.
Last year in one of my classes, I learned an evolutionary idea called evolutionary stasis. Evolutionary stasis basically explains the idea that evolution happens over a long period of time without any significant change or no change at all to some species. I'm not going to point out in a minute. There's no such thing as no change to some species. There may be no obvious change. And that means when I look at it, it looks the same a thousand years from now and today. I kind of really can't discern a difference just on my, my initial visualization. But if you get a microscope out, or if you look at its genetics, you look at its DNA, there's going to be differences, right? It's not going to be identical. It's not going to be a clone from a thousand years ago. Um, so I'm very careful about saying, I, I never want to say there's no change. You have, to quantify, you have to quantify that, or you have to qualify that. You have to say there's no obvious visible change to some species over time. And that would be a form of stasis, a stasis of morphological appearance. Okay, the basic idea of constant evolutionary change explains that species change and adapt over time, which would disapprove, would disapprove of this concept, or disprove this concept, and would be the exact opposite of this. How exactly does science explain the persistence of some species over millions of years with little or no change? Right, so this person who's asking, this, this student who's asking this question, they are, they are indicating here, they understand, the basic idea of constant evolutionary change and that's what I've been kind of saying is that all organisms are always changing. It's, it's you know, it, it, once you learn the population genetics of the Hardy-Weinberg formula, you quickly realize that it's really not possible for a population not to change. Every generation, it is changing. Um, and so that is the sort of the idea of constant evolutionary change, the constant adjustment uh, or, or change in allele frequencies over time. So now what they're asking is, it's a really good question. They're saying, okay, well, if, if everything is constantly changing, if there's evolutionary uh, change and that species are constantly adapting over time, wouldn't that disprove the concept that there would be the exact, wouldn't this concept, the concept of stasis, be the exact opposite of that? How exactly do scientists explain the persistence of some species over millions of years? How, how does a species, if it's always changing, not become another species? That's a, that's a really good question, right? And anybody that's curious, anyone who thinks about evolutionary theory at all, should ask this question at some point. And they deserve an answer. I'm going to try to answer it. With little or no change. And what would be some of the main reasons as to why we think these species have little or no change? This phenomena, which is real, we see it in the fossil record. Um... You can point to there's a number of different fossils that are you know like horseshoe crabs they're uh, hundreds of millions of years old and if i showed you that fossil the characteristics of it and i showed you a horseshoe crab from today you'd be like you look pretty similar to me you know, it's definitely a horseshoe crab now whether it's the same species or not you know that some species can be look almost identical but be definitely different species under most species concepts uh, because they lose their ability to um, reproduce with one another. So they might be different species, but nonetheless, the idea remains the same. There's um, something that looks very similar in the past as, as the same in the present. So we have observed many examples of this. And so here are some proposed mechanisms. All right, here's what I would suggest are possible ways to understand why, why there's a lack of significant change. The word important word here is significant, right? There has been a significant change in the characteristics of that organism. That organism has not changed into a different kind of organism, right? It hasn't changed from a, um, a, uh, a, a some primitive carnivore into a dog, right? Or into a cat. The cats and dogs are not evolving into each other. They evolve from a common ancestor. So it'd be wrong to ever suggest that dogs are somehow changing into cats. Uh, that would not be expected in evolutionary theory. All right, first of all, stable environment, right? One common explanation for why some organisms look the same in the past and the present is they have lived in a stable environment for a long time, right? If, if an organism lives in the same environment and it's well adapted to its environment, so 100 million years ago, a horseshoe crab is living in a particular environment uh, in shallow uh, sea beds, right? And that environmental condition, 
remains fairly constant through time. And they're already adapted to the environment. Why would they change into anything else? Natural selection is saying, you're doing a really good job. You're living your best life, right? If you try to have, if you have mutations that causes you to change any significant characters, any of your characteristics significantly, you actually become less adapted for that environment. So you either have two choices if you're gonna make changes. You better move to a new environment where your particular new mutation fits, it works better in that particular environment and allows you to survive there. But if you're gonna to continue to live in this environment and not any organism can just jump up and go like, uh, yeah, I'm gonna move over there. This is the environment I live in and it's relatively stable. And if I change, if an individual changes a lot, they're no longer fit for that environment. They don't survive very well and they don't pass their genes on. So guess what? The next generation, it looks like the previous generation. <laughs> it just, it's going to continue to look like the previous generation because it says, I need all these same characteristics to survive in this environment. The environment where horseshoe crabs live, has, there has that environment has existed for hundreds of millions of years. It's persisted throughout all the different changes and all the other different ways that the Earth's climate has changed. There's always been places in the ocean that have the habitat that horseshoe crabs can live in and have the resources they need to survive food-wise. So there isn't, that's called stabilizing selection, right? Natural selection works to maintain the same appearance over time. We said before, Evolution doesn't have a direction. It's not like saying every organism isn't like, I have to progress and change into other things. There's nothing about evolutionary biology, nothing about the mechanisms of evolution that requires that organisms change into something else, like fundamentally different biologically. Right? So the organism might have reached its sort of optimal fitness within that particular uh, ecological niche. And so, again, no reason to adapt because there's nothing to adapt to, right? They're fully adapted for that particular environment. Um, there also can be genetic constraints. Some organisms, uh, if they have small populations, if they don't have a lot of genetic variation, if they have some particular characteristic that is absolutely necessary for life in that particular environment, uh, that's going to be maintained over time. And it could be that that particular characteristic then, uh, it's called canalizes, but it, 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 it forces all the other characteristics basically to work within the context of that one characteristic. And so it's not like you can't change their leg number, you can't do this, you, you're, you can't really change the type of food you eat and so forth because this one characteristic is so vital for survival, you can't really play around with it, right? You can't, you can't alter that feature. You can't have a mutation, otherwise that organism ceases to exist. These things combine to force organisms to maintain similarities through time. But I wanna stress that it's unlikely they're the same species. You know, uh, something that looks like a coelacanth, uh, it, those fossils of coelacanths, by the way, uh, definitely have fairly significant differences between modern coelacanths and the old coelacanths in the fossil record, even though people will claim like, oh, they look just the same. Well, sure, standing five feet away and looking at it, it's like, yeah, that's a fish with lobes on it. That kind of looks like today's fish with lobes on it. But if you look at it closely, um, there are many, many characteristics that have changed. And so it wouldn't be appropriate to call it the same species. In fact, the fossil is not named the same species as today's coelacanth. It's given, it's in a different genus, right? Which indicates we think that it's significantly different enough that it's, that it's in a different group of species. But it's in the same general kind of fish, the lobefin fish. But my bigger point is this, even if it looked almost identical, it's very unlikely it would be the same species. The prediction would be if you could go and look at its genome, its genome from 50 million years ago to today, how could it change and go through hundreds of thousands of generations without experiencing mutations? Right? We know that there's no genome on Earth that can copy itself without making mutations changes. And so therefore, it would have to accumulate many, 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 many changes over uh, hundreds of thousands of generations. And so you might ask, well, then how can it not have changed, right? How can the organism not have changed very much? How come it looks the same if it's experienced hundreds of thousands of mutations? 
Well, every mutation that affected a gene that was important for its general appearance and function, every mutation that caused a disruption in that decreased its fitness and so didn't survive. But the genome has hundreds of millions of other base pairs that are much less important, and you can change an A for a T and not really affect the organism. And so what's happening is all the genes and the other spaces between the genes are accumulating differences, but the differences, natural selection is only keeping the changes that don't make any difference to the organism's overall appearance, to your eyes. So the organism is changing. And so it's like, it's like, it's like saying, uh, you know, I'm showing you two watches and they look the same on the face, but maybe you've designed the inner components differently, right, between the two watches. And you look at it and you're like, those are the same, those are the same watches. But actually the design inside is quite different, but achieves the same purpose on the outside. And so that's what, you would, that's what you'd see between an old coelacanth and a coelacanth today. If you were to watch its genome, you'd see the genome is just like changing constantly through time, but the organism's overall appearance isn't. Uh, and so those are the so-called, you know, living fossils. And, you know, many, many um, people who are skeptical of evolutionary biology will point to these types of things as you like, see, evolution doesn't happen. But they have a false concept of evolution that evolution requires organisms to change into different things over time. There's no such requirement. They can stay functionally the same over time as long as the environment stays the same and they're well adapted to that environment. I would say it's an expectation of evolutionary theory that some species will not have changed very much over time. Continuing on with the theme of species. As discussed in lecture, more species have become extinct before than there were available on the planet today. Yes, we talked about how there's been um, many billions of species. Right? So our look in the fossil record suggests that there are many times, hundreds of times more species that have existed and gone extinct than are present right now alive today, even though there is three to 10, you know, yeah, million species alive today. So therefore, extinction and death, <laughs> it's part of the cycle of life, right? Most species are extinct. Now, we tend to put more emphasis on saving the species than, than, the, than are going extinct. If extinction is different species is normal, then is there a good reason for trying to save the species that are going extinct? Or are we just trying to fix our mistakes so that we feel better? All right, love the question. It's a great question. Species are doomed, so why do we save them? Right? This is a natural, um, I think this is a natural expression of a reaction to data presented in the class or any earth science class, really. If the earth is really old and you have had hundreds of millions, actually probably many billions of different species and each species having potentially billions and billions of individuals and they're all gone and we only have a very small 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 percentage of all the all the different types of species that have ever lived on earth to alive today that means extinction is the rule of history right now of course all those species had to come into existence too so there's been a lot of speciation Right. And the fact there's still species alive today means that speciation overall must exceed extinction in the grand scheme of things. Nonetheless, tons of stuff has gone extinct. And therefore, the future of most species alive today is for them to go extinct. Yeah, many of them will change into other species. And so in a way, the species that's here now will no longer exist, but it will have persisted in the form of a new species. Many species will not leave any descendants and therefore truly goes extinct, right? And that's true for a lot of organisms, in the past, like most of the dinosaurs, right? They truly did not leave any descendants, and therefore they're truly extinct. Okay, back to this question. If extinction is normal, all right, then why are we trying to save species? They're just doomed anyway. Are we just trying to make ourselves feel better by, you know, protecting the environment around us? So. Yes, it's true that extinction is a natural process and it's occurred throughout Earth's history. But you have to remember that today there is a, a you know, and again, we'll look at this later in class. We'll look at the extinction cycle. We'll look at uh, large extinction events and then sort of the, 
the reintroduction of new species. So there are periods in which there is expansion of species and kinds of organisms, right, through speciation. Um, and then a knocking back of the number of species through extinction events, where extinction is at a greater pace than uh, origination. Uh, and right now, it's pretty obvious over the last couple hundred years that we're in a more organisms are going extinct than are coming into existence. That is, we're entering into a state of mass extinction. We could argue, I don't think there's a lot of argument, but uh, one could argue about what the cause of that extinction is. Uh, but it's pretty clear that some climatic changes that have occurred uh, combined with human beings uh, paving over the world and uh, putting crops in and greatly affecting the landscape, obviously humans are causing some extinctions, right? We simply mowed over or bulldozed over areas with uh, you know rare species, and that species is extinct. So it's you can't deny that humans cause extinction. You can argue about how much extinction and how important those extinctions are. Um, so if we're meeting, if we're entering into a period of mass extinction, the concern would be that if we drive organisms to extinction at a faster pace then speciation can make new ones. And you're going to learn in this class, it takes a while to make a new species typically, right? It's a lot of generations of small scale changes of allele frequencies and mutations and so forth. And if you just do the population genetics and model that out, you're going to find out it's going to take tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of generations to take the red foxes, right? For which there are multiple different subspecies alive today which have taken probably tens of thousands of years, if not 100,000 years or more, to get to the point where they're kind of proto-species. To take them into turning them into full-fledged new species of canines, um, that could take another 100,000 generations for a few of them to become new species. That's a lot of time. And if many species are going extinct every single year, then there's so much more extinction than there is new origination. That has to be a concern for the ongoing overall biological diversity of the Earth. All right. So what we'd say is that the extinction crisis is happening at what an unprecedented rate. And it's expected to continue because of potential climate change. All right. So the emphasis on saving species from extinction, that stems from the recognition that this accelerated loss of biodiversity is being caused in part by human activities. And therefore, the potential consequences of this loss, you know, on the eco ecosystem is partly our responsibility. All right. And even if you didn't like feel any moral responsibility, like, yeah, we're just species in, in this environment and, you know, we're doing what we're doing. And if that causes changes, well, that's part of the environment. They just couldn't adapt fast enough, right? They couldn't keep up with us. The problem with that is we know what natural selection is and how it works. And we know the importance of biological diversity uh, through our studies of the world. And we know that the consequences of what the con potential consequences of those losses are right to our own well-being right we need that genetic diversity for future crops we need that genetic diversity in order to help our domesticated crops be continue to thrive what we're learning now is we really need to take genes out of wild organisms in order to put them into domesticated crops again you can talk about the bioethics of that as well but um we can integrate wild genetic variation into uh, domesticated crops in order to make them more fruitful or be able to resist pesticides and so forth, right? Res resist pests. And so it's, um, in, yeah, I want to rehearse all the different ways that, um, that lack of biodiversity will harm humans in the future. So therefore that should give us some reason to think that uh, we should mitigate that damage because of the future consequences, right? We know enough about evolutionary biology. We know enough about, I just said, we know enough about the mechanisms of how things change to know that the world isn't simply going to adapt and keep up. It's more likely to go extinct. And we know that by looking at history. It's like, oh, we look back at a time, we see like, there are things that happened in the past where the climate changed really rapidly. And guess what? You know, a third of all the organisms on our, all the species on earth, they're like, were wiped out. And they were gone. And then after that, the world changed a lot. 
but it took tens of thousands of well it took hundreds of thousands of years for the world to kind of like get its act back together and begin to increase diversity again and it took millions and millions of years in order to get back to the point where it had as much biodiversity as it might have had before that extinction event and if you want to think about your lives and the lives of your children we're only talking about a couple hundred years and um, that's not the time frame on which evolution works uh, and so quick changes to the environment will result in organisms not being able to adapt fast enough and that's why they go extinct right they can't keep up if the, if the environment changes very very slowly well then organisms see slight changes they can make slight adaptations and I don't mean make like they anticipate or they know the world is changing so they're like oh I need to have mutations so I'll make this mutation so I can adapt you know better than that i hope you know that what happens is the population has lots of genetic mutations some of those when the environment changes will have an advantage in that new environment they'll be selected for and they'll become the new generation with new genetics as a result of that and that's how adaption is happening wow i'm not even halfway through the questions and i just looked at the time and it's already been an hour and 40 minutes Whew, I, I knew that I was going to talk longer than I than I should. I had no idea it was going to be that much. So I'm going to have to try to pick up the pace. Right. I'm going to do this in two parts, but nonetheless, we're not even done with part one. So let's just get, get to the questions here. Evolution of sociality and cognition. Uh, we can clearly see that species evolve physically through time. Right? Their physical traits change because the physical traits are tied to uh, genes, right? tied to the genetic information which could be a cause of different selection pressures and changes in their environments right environment changes different selection pressures it would be interesting to see how social and cognitive factors change throughout time for example the way species can communicate and problem solve to gain an evolutionary edge so my question is how do social factors and cognition contribute to the evolution of complex behaviors in social species how do these behaviors impact the long-term survival and ecological niche do you know of any examples Right. Now, I'll say that social factors and cognition, they do play a significant role in the evolution of complex behaviors. All right. Especially in what we call social species, which of which human beings are definitely a social species, but we're not the only one. There's many different species that have uh, a, a lot of social aspects to them, cooperative uh, effects and so forth. So these behaviors they do impact the long-term survival and the ecological niche in which species are living in in a variety of different ways so here's some things uh, that i would uh, i would consider in that um, so for example like i said before cooperative behaviors right social insects you know social species sorry got social insects on my mind uh, social species exhibit cooperative behaviors where individuals work together right for what mutual benefit um, these behaviors include co like cooperative hunting, sharing resources, uh, maybe cooperative defenses against predators, you know, and in that cooperation, they then aid the environment, they aid the survival of the entire species or the entire group or population, right? In which case that allows for that population to reproduce and whatever it is that allowed them to have that behavior is then going to get past the next generation oh now i just gave you a hint as to what's happening here behaviors the question kind of implies like physical features are determined by genetics but what about uh cognitive and uh, social features uh, and behaviors well clearly behavior also has a genetic component i don't want to say that all social factors and behaviors are absolutely driven by only genetics um, although you'd be hard pressed to sort of try to explain uh, other factors there, right, in any naturalistic sense. So let's just stick to there are behavioral patterns, how individuals act and behave toward other individuals in the population, how they would agree to cooperate and so forth. There is a genetic uh, factor there and that's been studied widely in many insects and it can be shown that certain genes taken out or blocked or whatever change the behavior of the organisms so we know it's a genetic effect so since it is genetic it's also heritable which means that that characteristic how does that evolve well if there's an advantage 
if there's a genetic variant such that two individuals cooperate on something and they both survive better because of that cooperation, well, then they're going to have more offspring. If they have more offspring, they're going to pass that cooperative gene down to the next generation and their offspring will be more cooperative. So in an environment where cooperation is beneficial for the survival of the population, there's going to be a selective pressure to increase the amount of cooperation in that particular environment. All right, so um, these behaviors can be seen in like social insects, uh, like ants and bees and termites, right? They live in really organized colonies. They might have specialized roles, right? So they divvy up the genetics into different alleles and different organisms and different individuals in the population, giving them different behavioral properties. In fact, even different physical features, allowing them to take on different tasks uh, in that environment. Right. So they defend the colony. They and they they procure resources in better ways. And all these things add up to what they add up to more successful reproduction. And that's the key. More successful reproduction results in a reinforcement of those particular behaviors. So what about even other features that seem like higher level features? So like dolphins, right? They have complex systems of vocalization. They communicate. They even coordinate group activities like they do hunting and they have defensive activities. They talk to each other in that way. So their ability to communicate, uh, that allows them to do what? By communicating in, prote in protection, well, they are more likely to survive if they're better communicators. What if they are better communicators about hunting practices? Uh, where are the fish? Well, then they all procure more fish. They're all more likely to survive. And as a group, they then are more likely to reproduce and have offspring. Therefore, they're going to pass those genes to the next generation. So if you had five groups of dolphins and one of them had a mutation that augmented their ability or increased their, you know, some hormone in their brain such that they were more likely to uh, communicate, more likely to share with another organism because actually sharing might not be in many cases isn't natural right you don't, you might not think of it as natural because you think of it as like well if i get more resources i can reproduce uh, but if i share I, I might not be as fit in the environment i need all the food i can get but cooperating sometimes is better mutualistic it ends up with both individuals surviving better that behavior will then lead to in group organizations group environments that will lead to better success of the whole entire group in which case the entire group then benefits and it has a group if it survives better than maybe some other group that doesn't have quite that much co cooperation and so that group will reproduce more have more offspring and then that produces more groups of individuals that have those same genes and therefore have those behavior types and so you can see how that particular behavior can continue to be refined over time and become more and more and more sophisticated. Okay, going on too long again. I, I'm tempted to talk too much about each one of these. Uh, in the first chapter, we learned that whales are mammals that have evolved to survive in the ocean through natural selection. But this was found as a result of modern research on whales and fossils. But if they evolved to survive in the oceans, why, why does this mean it was due to natural selection? And if a species were to go extinct, would one of the questions automatically be, if they weren't able to adapt to the environment they were living in. Uh, I'm not sure I read that right. Automatically be if they weren't able to adapt to the environment they were in. Oh, I think the idea is why would they go extinct rather than adapt? You know, hey, if they were so good at adapting by natural selection to this particular environment, survival in the sea, and then they go extinct, well, does that mean they weren't able to adapt? This actually goes back to what I was just saying a few moments ago. If the environment changes too rapidly, Adaptation takes time. It's not an instantaneous thing. Um, yes, there might be a bacteria that in a new environment happens to have just the right mutation and all of a sudden it's able to adapt, adapt to that new environment because it has that new characteristic. Antibiotic resistance, when suddenly an antibiotic is introduced to the environment, that particular bacteria that happened to have that resistance is better adapted, right? But for a large animal, um, that it's going to have offspring only every few years. So the generations it's going to take to generate new populations and spread a particular gene that's better adapted for that environment. If the environment changes rapidly, the organism is going to have to go through maybe hundreds of generations in order to catch up to that particular environment. They don't have hundreds of generations of time. 
And so they're going to be pushed to extinction. Um, you know, the environment changes and maybe it's not optimal for them, but they can still survive. They can limp along. And that's what most, that's what a lot of species have done in history. The environment changes. The organisms are not the best fit for that new environment, but they're fit enough. And that's an important thing to remember. All you have to do is be fit enough to survive and you can continue the species. Um, but if they're not as fit as they were before, they might not have as many offspring, in which case the species becomes maybe starts to shrink. Maybe it's reduced in the amount of environments it can live in. Right. But as long as it can sort of try to survive for hundreds of generations, it might experience enough changes that it can now start to expand maybe its niche again or take on new niches, find a new way to survive in that new environment, and it will become a survivor. It'll be one of those species that actually manages to make it through this, this bottleneck of environmental change. The truth is, just like we just talked about, there's billions of species that have gone extinct. They never did adapt, right? They, they got squeezed out. And part of it also is because some other species adapted faster or was better in that particular new environment. And uh, so they never could move into that environment because there was already another species that, that sort of took over, right? The competition got to. All right, so back to this question. They evolved to survive in the ocean through natural selection, but it's found as a result of modern research on whales and fossils. But if they evolved to survive in the ocean, what, what does that mean it was due to natural selection? I, I'm not sure what the question is here, although I think there might be a misconception about um, natural selection. Natural selection is simply referring to the process uh, via the process in which organisms uh, are living in an environment and their fitness is being, individuals are selected for whether they're better fit for that environment than another and therefore have a better chance to survive and have offspring. And if they do, they can contribute their genetic information to the next generation. And that next generation will reflect their genetics more so than the other members of the population. And if those new genetics are more fit for that, that environment, then they're becoming more adapted to that environment. So if the environment is the ocean sitting there and organisms are gradually becoming better fit to live in the ocean, the ocean is a constant environmental factor that's basically challenging them. Like, you can survive pretty well here, well enough, going back to the previous question, right? As long as you can survive well enough. Oh, actually, I was just saying that a moment ago. As long as you can survive in this environment, then there's a chance that in the, your, 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 your descendants will continue to have more changes that will become even more fit for this particular environment. Right? Lots of organisms aren't perfectly fit for their environment. They're simply fit enough to survive there, and they're fit better fit than any other organism in that particular niche. Uh, whales are, are an interesting example because... Uh, after the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene uh, extinction, in which all the sea, large sea reptiles went extinct, mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, right? Those organisms were large reptiles that fed and lived in the ocean in similar environments that whales do today. But all of a sudden they're gone. So now you just have this huge ocean with lots of food in it. Um, and you have some sharks. But you really don't have these large animals that can graze and feed on fish and plankton and all these other things there. So animals on land that are semi-adapted to the water and can fish in the water and get things out of the water, um, they don't really have any competition out there, right, in the ocean. And so that is an amazing environment to maybe take advantage of. And so that's the challenge that that world presented, you know, to mammals living on land. Like if you could adapt to this environment, you would have an abundance of food, right? And the way I'm saying that is actually kind of inappropriate. Inappropriate. It's like if you could adapt as if organisms are like, hey, you know what? I think I'll change and go and live in the, in the ocean. It's more like, hey, you've got thousands of animals living on land. They're competing with each other. The individuals that can spend more time in the water and get more food in the water than they can on land, they probably have a better chance of surviving because of the competition on land. They don't have as much competition in the water. And then when they have changes, they then are better adapted to being in the water. And then they have a few more changes because they're still living in the, you know, as much as they can on getting food from the water and therefore they continue to get better and better and better and being in the water. 
And since they don't have a lot of competition, it's like, I'm not perfect at this job, right? My snout is like over here. It's not all the way in the back of my head like a blowhole, which would be awesome. But I don't have a blowhole. I, but I can still put my head up and, and breathe some air once in a while and I can live. I can survive. And I've got a, an abundance of food and that's, that's great. So I'll keep having offspring. And those offspring will just continue to, to better adapt to this world. And eventually you have something that's really well adapted to the world, you know, those things. But if the environment changes really quickly, some whales go extinct, right? Especially if you have people hunting whales, right? <laughs> they can't adapt to harpoons, you know, uh, uh, you know, powered harpoons. Um, uh, you know, that's just something that, that is an environmental factor that's way beyond their control. And therefore, they could go extinct as a result of that new environmental factor. Whew. Still still taking way too much time on these questions. Convergent evolution is an interesting concept, and it's the process of similar traits or structures arising in different organisms that do not share a common ancestor with that trait. An example of this is how birds and bats both have wings and can fly, even though bats are in the class Mammalia and birds are in the class Aves. And the animals do not have a common ancestor with wings. All right, that's essentially the definition of convergent evolution. Uh, those two organisms are converging on a similar trait, the trait of flight, even though their ancestor didn't have flight. So they separately met the challenge of the air, right? If you could live up there and fly, you can fly away from danger. You can live up in the trees. There's all kinds of advantages, right, to, to being a flying organism. And so if you could find a way to do that, you would have a big advantage. Flying is an important adaptation that helps bats and birds catch food, avoid enemies, and travel. Oh, th there you go. Another interesting example of convergent evolution is that there are many known organisms that create and utilize venom. Yes, it's true. Many organisms have a type of venom. My question that caused the, what caused the advent of venom to rise in so many different species independently? How did this adaptation develop? Ah, glad you asked. I'm not really going to provide a big answer to this one. I can make this fairly short because there's a whole section of the chapter coming up pretty soon, which is about the origin of venom. All right. Most specifically in um, snakes, showing how, I'll give a tiny preview, all right? Showing how some of the, if you look at the phylogeny of snakes and you trace back snakes, like almost all snakes make some kind of venom-like thing. And even if snakes that don't have venom have the genes that make similar chemicals to venom, they just don't express them in the same way. Uh, and so there's a whole really interesting uh, history there of genes that were used for certain purposes in the pancreas and digestive uh, things, and then the gene being duplicated and then being expressed in the mouth. And so now those enzymes are being produced in the mouth. And so there's sort of like a whole bunch of different steps in which venom is being uh, added as a concoction of many different, basically common enzymes that have been tweaked gradually over time through mutations, and then uh, ending up in some particular snakes being extremely specialized. But there is sort of a common ancestry of most of the venom-type genes in snakes, but there are other organisms that make venom, right? And some of them make very similar venoms, and that would be the, sim the idea of convergent evolution, that they use the same type of gene. That's, many of the genes are very common, like you and I have most of these genes, uh, the same gene family but they have uh, tweaked those genes to make slightly different uh, products and they also express them in different places, right? All right, let's, let's move on. I don't wanna spend too much time on that. Okay, so that's the end of part one. We got through about half the questions. <laughs> so uh, I gotta take a break. So we're gonna have part two and we still have to talk about, uh, can, we, uh, can we evolve a bird? No, we gotta talk about, we have several questions about the interface of religion and evolutionary theory. Um, does evolutionary theory matter? The origin of life, life on other planets. Actually, we've got like the big questions coming up. It's a little scary to me because I spent so much time on these first, uh, what, 13 or 14 questions. Uh, to think that the hard questions are, are yet before me. All right, I'm gonna quit there. Uh, that's part one of answering students' questions uh, about evolutionary biology.
We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.